rules. Seems like our lives are sometimes governed by them, doesn't it? Rules. I don't know if any of you dabble in the stock market, or trade in shares or anything like that. But if there's any rules that apply to the stock market, is everything good up there, by the way, with the recording, Zach? Yeah, cool. Great. So if any rules apply to the stock market, uh, here's some. Now get ready to roll your eyes at me and groan out loud because there's going to be a stack of really bad puns that will flow forth liberally. All right, so in the stock market, elevators rise. Mining equipment hits what? Rock bottom. Helium was up, floating, even better. Beef steered into a bull market. Paper was stationary. <laughs> An actual laugh. I thought these were dreadful puns. That's cool. Uh, fluorescent tubing was dimmed in light trading. Now, that certainly deserves an eye roll. Weights were up in heavy trading. Feathers were down. Light switches, they were off. Shipping lines stayed an even keel, but the market for raisins dried up. <laughs> Balloon prices were completely inflated. A major tissue brand touched a new bottom. <laughs> Where did you get these from? <laughs> Knives were up sharply. Sun stocks peaked at midday, but nappies remain unchanged. <laughs> Rules. Now, if you ask most people out there about the Ten Commandments, they'd probably think of them as a list of rules. Some might even say that they're a reasonable list of rules. Others will probably fail to see how they could possibly still be relevant today. But either way, the Ten Commandments are likely to be seen as a set of rules. Sometimes there's this perception out there that Christians follow a set of Ten Demandments, if you like, something like that, you know. That's not at all what they are. I mentioned briefly last week as we had a broad introductory look at this, um, couched in the context of a bit of our local history here in the ACT and Canberra. It was a connection that I drew there in kicking this series off, but I briefly touched on the fact that the commandments, the Ten Commandments, are divided into two tables. The first table are those that deal with our vertical relationship, if you like. Um, our relationship with God. And the remainder, the second table, deal with our horizontal um, relationality in the world around us. In other words, our relationship with each other. So today, I'll deal with the first table, the vertical stuff. Uh, the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church and I think some other major denominations, Anglicans, um, would number these as one, two and three. There are some other major denominations like the Reformed churches and Baptists and various denominations affiliated with them and probably um, many of the Pentecostal ones, as far as I'm aware, would number it slightly differently. The ones we're dealing with today, they would number as one, two, three, and four. What we have as one, they would split into one and two. And therefore, what we have as nine and 10, they combine into 10. Either way, it doesn't matter. They're the words of God, and there's 10 groupings of them, neatly enough, in the text, no matter how we break it down. And what matters is the content of them and their applicability to us today. 
So before we get into the actual three commandments themselves, why might they still apply today, or do they? Let's not put a leading statement here. Let's ask, do they apply to us today as Christians who follow Jesus Christ, who fulfilled perfectly the law of God? Do the Ten Commandments apply to us today? Very good. They apply to us today and also in the sense of proper law. Great. That segues neatly from where we left this last week, uh, where we looked at what the Lutheran way of reading Scripture, the Lutheran Christians read Scripture in a way that um, looks for certain things like law and gospel, that we see Jesus in every page of the Old Testament as well as the New. Um, and, and so... In looking at that, we reflected on the fact that there's, there's said to be three particular uses or application of God's law. Um, and one is exactly what you said just there. It applies generally to the ordering, the good order and the peaceable relationship of society in general. There's laws against theft, murder, various other things. And they come directly from the law of God. So the first use of the law is it orders the world. And the second use of the law, just to recap on this last point from last week, um, is that it's a mirror. We look at the law of God at the standard he sets and we realise we fall short. It's a mirror that convicts us of sin and brings us to the foot of the cross of Christ, to the place of redemption. And thirdly, and this is probably where we touch on it today again, they're guideposts for living. Jesus fulfilled the law, so we don't need to try to follow it to get saved or to be right with God, but it gives us God's standard on a life that pleases him. So as people who have been saved, the law of God sets to delineate or define where the lane that he's called us to traverse in this lifetime goes so that we stay on the right track. So that as saved people, we can lead lives that also honour God, worship him and please him, not through our works, but through Christ's finished work on our behalf. Yes, the Ten Commandments do apply today. Here's three reasons why. Firstly, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfil it. He said not one iota will pass away before the coming of the Son of Man. And so it's in that sense that we can think of the law with its three uses, and specifically here it's that third one, the guideposts for holy living. Second reason why the Ten Commandments still apply to us today, it shows us how to please God as saved believers, the point I just made. So thirdly, um, following God's blueprint for life guarantees a fulfilled life, a blessed life. What I just said there can be very easily taken out of context, so I want you to hear it right. There is a false gospel out there called the prosperity gospel, which says if you sow enough money into this, um, then material blessings and wealth will come your way. Uh, Jesus doesn't promise that. He promises instead that we will each have a cross to bear, a burden to carry as we work with him and walk with him and follow him and he leads us. We're promised that there'll be hardship in this life, but that has nothing to do with this. Fulfillment and blessing are things within that the Holy Spirit gives that nothing in this world can take away. Faithful believers, the martyrs, the great martyrs of the Christian faith over the centuries were tortured to within a millimetre of their life and their lives taken and yet not a single bit of that peace that comes from the truth was able to be removed from them as they stood their ground and gave a faithful witness to the very end. So Jesus came to fulfil the law, not abolish it. 
The law shows us how to please God as saved believers. And thirdly, following God's blueprint guarantees a fulfilled life because it's a life that puts God first and others ahead of ourselves. In my home congregation in southeast Queensland, it was in 1995, I was in year eight, I just started high school from uh, a local state school just outside town to then go to high school at the Catholic College in the middle of the local town. Anyway, in the local Lutheran congregation, I did confirmation with our local pastor in 1995. And we all were given or asked to get, I forget how it went, this. Is this a familiar book? I've even still got some little stickers on there. Um, the hot air balloon that says he lifts our spirits. Um, a little sticker down the bottom that says the light of the world is Jesus. And also another sticker that says pray at all times, the wise looking colourful owl giving us that advice there. Um, Luther's small catechism is what um, we were asked to have when I did confirmation. And what I have here are some little booklets that come from um, Lutheran Tract Mission down in Adelaide. Could I get a couple people to circulate these around the room, please? Thank you. Although there's your half over that side won't take long. <laughs> And really, these are more or less words that come out of this uh, small catechism 500 years ago, which form um, quite a significant part of the Protestant Reformation stream of the Christian faith in which our body of Christ, our church family, um, is strongly founded. So if we look at the first three commandments, let's read it together, actually. The first commandment, I am the Lord your God. Do not have any God except me. And what does this mean? We are to fear, love, and trust God above all things. Idol worship. Exodus 20, the reading we just heard from Rhonda says in verse 2, the Lord says here, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That there is the very foundation of all these commands of God. The fact that God has rescued his chosen people supernaturally and through the ten plagues inflicted against Egypt, each of which was a direct act of spiritual warfare from the Lord himself against specific Egyptian deities, the Lord God, through each of those ten plagues, smashed those ten, the powers of those ten Egyptian idols that that nation served and worshipped at that point in time. That's very important to realise. For example, the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, those were the symbols that represented the particular deities worshipped in those instances and the fact that the frogs and the gnats overcame uh, the whole land meant that the powers of those deities were just routed. And it's the case for all ten of those plagues. And God reminds his people here that he is the one who brought them out of slavery to the demonic as well as literal slavery in Egypt to, to harsh rulers that they'd been subject to for 400 years. And he was taking them to the promised land. That's the setting for the Ten Commandments. Never forget who I am, basically, is what God is saying here. So therefore, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And then verses 4 through to 6, 
I think, in um, Lutheran and other mainline traditions are taken to be an explanation of what we just heard in verse 3, whereas the, more, the Reformed Baptist traditions would split these into two commandments. In any case, what we have in this little booklet and in, in, in the catechism here is verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me, but listen to these words which follow from verses 4 to 6. You shall not, and you can follow along if you've got the Bible here with you, uh, page 56 in these ones. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. That's that famous command against what in the old English were described as graven images. You may be familiar with that phrase. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. That's a stern warning, actually. And it's interesting, reflecting on that, where you see families that are devoted to literal idol worship of some kind, and how that may perpetuate through the generations with bonds to the demonic realm that operates behind it. Uh, verse 6, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Okay, third or fourth generation, yes, the repercussions, but the love, love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my command. Hang on a minute. Doesn't that sound very similar to what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, John 14? We looked at this just the other week. If you love me, you will obey my commands. Jesus almost mirrors the words here given by the Lord God himself in the midst of fire, smoke, glory, and black darkness, trumpet blast to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. Yes, idol worship is literal. Uh, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the power behind that um, is a demonic power, but the idols themselves are nothing the idols, the statues, the figures, whatever the physical representation is of the deity being worshipped. The lump of wood, the stone, the plaster, it doesn't amount to anything in and of itself. But 1 Corinthians 10, verses 18 to 22, Paul writes, Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, the specific context there is Paul's talking about the Lord's Supper, so that's why there's that. Um, but it, the point there is that idol worship is a portal to the occult, essentially, to demonic powers. Um, and that's a literal understanding of idolatry, but Luther expands it out, and um, I think Jesus expanded out God's commands even more when we consider, say, the one uh, where he says about, about um, lust, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, and Jesus expands the definition to, to mean lust as well as physical adultery. Well, similarly, uh, we can expand the application of this first command to an attitude of the heart, and Luther puts it that Anything that has the affections of our heart, I'm paraphrasing it here, and the devotion of our lives more than God 
is to us an idol or a false god. Jeffrey Curtis Paul asks four very good questions if we're to consider where might idolatry in this respect be at work in our lives. He asks, where do I spend my time? Where do I spend my money? Where do I get my joy? What is always on my mind? An honest appraisal might shed some very interesting light on possible areas of idolatry in our lives. One of the modern greats of the Christian faith, Pastor Timothy Keller, who uh, unfortunately passed away just, um, I think, a couple months ago, uh, wrote excessively in the latter decade or two of his life. Um, he started um, a very successful Presbyterian church in New York City and pastored that for many decades, and that's no mean feat in that location. In his writing ministry following his time serving at Redeemer Presbyterian, um, he wrote, among other things, on idolatry. And there's a little checklist that he has here, um, a little idolatry inventory, where there's a list of things, uh, life only has meaning or I only have worth if. Now, as you read this, keep that in mind. Otherwise, this can be an incredibly legalistic piece of paper. Um, for example, I'll pull some out at random. I am highly productive. Well, I only have worth if I get things done. Is that an idol of work? That's what this sheet asks. My political or social cause is better than others. Uh, is that an idol of ideology? Life only has meaning if I have pleasure. I only have worth if I experience a certain quality of life. Is that an idol of comfort? There's about a dozen things on this list here, and I've got a handout for all of us this morning. And on the reverse side of the page, if you circled one of the four on the previous list, there's many more than four, but if you circled one of them, um, then in this table, that's on the next page, it might help us work through some of this. If, for example, I'll give you, just go through one, and uh, would we be able to get those handed around the room, please? Yeah, perfect, thank you. If you seek approval, such as affirmation or love or relationship, your greatest struggles will be rejection. People around you feel smothered or crowded. Your problem emotion could be cowardice or timidity. That's just one example of working through this. Might be worth keeping in mind as we... Um, work through this here this morning. So are these ten demandments? Well, actually, if we understand the way the original language is in the scriptures, this is a really important point. Um, please hear this. This is more descriptive than prescriptive in that respect. More descriptive than prescriptive. Yes, they are commands that God gives, but it's actually a description of reality when our hearts are oriented toward God, when he is our first love, then these are the ways in which our life becomes shaped. Do you see the difference there? That's the difference between laying down the law and flogging you with a stick or a whip and saying, do and don't do this or that, versus if God is your first love, this is how your life is going to be shaped. 
It's a work of grace. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And that is an important point that I don't want you to miss. Now, we go back to this little booklet here, the second commandment. Let's read it together. You are not to misuse the name of your God. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, practice magic, lie or deceive using God's name, but instead use that very name in every time of need to call on, pray to, praise and give thanks to God. Well, I challenge you, try going, I oh, don't mean this, for goodness sake, try going to a place like Iran and speaking flippantly against Allah or curse using the name of Muhammad and see where that ends up. You know, other major faiths and belief systems demand a certain respect. But isn't it inconsistent, to say the very least, that very little is shown to the Christian faith? Where an OMG becomes just like saying wow or a four-letter word of some other kind, where the name of our Lord, our Saviour Jesus Christ, is used as a term of shock, as a swear word when someone swerves in in front of you, in busy traffic, when someone surprises you, when you hurt yourself. How flippantly is the name of our Lord God Most High used? We are immersed in a culture where the name of God is only used as a curse word. An OMG or a... Using the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, as a swear word, that grieves my spirit more than almost any other thing addressed by these Ten Commandments. It troubles me deeply. But who cares about what that does to me? The point here is, how does God feel? Oh, I've just put out a big law statement there, haven't I? But this command is about much more than just that, about what we might call blasphemy. And by the way, in Jesus' day, blasphemy, it was a capital offence, and that's one reason why Jesus, referring to himself as the Son of God, caused such outrage in the religious establishment. But what is it to use the Lord's name in vain? Well, we had it spelled out a little bit here. Fear and love God. A holy reverence. A healthy fear of the sovereignty of God. There's nothing to be afraid of, but there's every reason to be in awe of the majesty of the living Lord God. Fear and love God so that we do not... So you put our alignment, primarily this links back to the first commandment, be aligned to God above all else. And we are to fear and love God so that we do not curse. I think the blasphemy bit is covered there. Or swear. In other words, take oaths using the name of God. I swear to God. Um, or, you know, James says, don't swear by God's name. 
nor by anything in this realm. Like, I don't know. Anything in this realm, I swear, by my mother's grave. Or silly things to say like that. Or by anything in the underworld. Don't, no, don't swear by any of that. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no because as James says, anything beyond that comes from the evil one. In other words, have integrity. Be a person of your word. Practice magic or some other versions. What did this, this thing here that I learnt in 1995 puts it? Um... Use his name superstitiously, use it to curse, swear, lie, deceive, but call on him. Yeah, some versions uh, make reference to practising the satanic arts as well. Uh, that's magic, occult, all of that stuff. Uh, using it superstitiously as well. Um, brings to mind that on the last day there are some that face Christ who performed miracles in his name, who drove out demons in his name, and yet Jesus says to them, away from me, you workers of evil, I never knew you. It is possible to see miracles in Jesus' name and yet not have faith in him, to be known by him, but merely to use his name and the power of it superstitiously without true faith. More than just blasphemy, it is certainly that, but more than just that, those who name the name of Christ, who pray in his name and who take his name as part of their identity, but who deliberately and continually disobey his commands are taking his name in vain. When we say we love him, but we do not do what he commands, we take his name in vain. Positively put, if we truly love our Lord, we will show our love for him through valuing his name and using it with great respect and certainly not using it as a swear word. But more than that, letting our lives reflect his sovereignty in us. Let's flip the page in the booklet to the third commandment. <laughs> special day, it says here. <laughs> remember God's special day and keep it holy, or remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching or God's word, but instead keep that word holy and gladly hear and learn it. How many days, as Genesis describes it, did God take to create all that exists? Six, and on the seventh, the Lord rested from all the work of creation and he blesses something on the seventh day. What does the Lord specifically bless and set aside as holy right there at the outset of creation and therefore making it something that is applicable and relevant to all people of all time. The Sabbath. He blesses the day itself. Not a person, place, object. He blesses the very day, the seventh day, and sets up a pattern in doing so. God rested and he blessed that day. Of course, for the Old Testament people of God, that was always meant to point to the Sabbath rest that the Messiah would bring, and in fact Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, brought on his atoning death 
at Calvary, where his blood shed for all makes us right with God and gives us a Sabbath rest, us who put our trust in Christ, who love him and follow him as the Lord of our lives. Because he has finished that work for us and applies it to us as a gift of grace. So for the Old Testament, the Sabbath day was always meant to lead, point to that one moment in history in the shape of a cross, drenched in blood, to bring an eternal rest to the soul. Do you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4? Page 890 in this version here. I'll just look at verses um, from verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience, the, the people of God, the Israelites who rebelled, is the example mentioned there. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now the Sabbath is the day each week that God calls us to set apart for public worship of a Christian fellowship. When we gather with God's people on the Lord's day, the day of Christ's resurrection, the first day of the week, we are gathering to do what God created and redeemed us to do, and that is to worship him. Jesus came to fulfil the law, not to abolish it. So in relation to the first commandment, Jesus now is the only way to God. In relation to the second commandment, Jesus Christ is the name above all names. And in relation to the third commandment, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, is our Sabbath rest. May I pray, in the prayer I'm going to pray, it's, they're not my words, I have an attribution here, but I don't have in my notes who wrote it. But I think it's a neat prayer that helps us to rest in this third commandment, the rest that is fulfilled in Christ. Heavenly Father, we joyfully and humbly receive your gift of the Sabbath. Show us how to remember it in a way that honours you. We are grateful for the many ways that we're able to draw near to you every day especially on a Sabbath day. It is a delight to our soul. Thank you for the ways you fill our spiritual, our mental and physical needs for your glory as we rest in you and in your sovereignty over our lives. Amen. Well, those vertical relationships, the first table of the law. Next week, our minister trainee and lay preacher trainee, Zach, will lead us in looking at the second table of the law. Uh, and that'll be split over two weeks as we consider the remaining seven of the Ten Commandments of God. God be with you all. Amen.